All right, well, good evening, morning, whenever you're doing this. Uh, so this is our first uh, opportunity to try out some of this distance learning. Uh, what my plan is today is to go through, talk a little bit about double slit diffraction. Uh, this first little video is going to be about some of the theory, about the equations, how they work, with some graphics and all that. I'm then going to set you to a reading in the book and then have you uh, try some questions in the book. And the second video will be me working through some of those worked examples and talking about some different types of situations, focusing more on the math. And so hopefully that'll help you understand things pretty well and you'll be able to solve some of the problems that I gave you. Now, if you recall the other day, uh, by the way, what we're covering today, as you see here, is uh, we are covering double slit diffraction. We are looking at how uh, two slit interference problems, uh, including modulation by one slit diffraction effect. We're gonna look at how double slit and single slit works together. We're gonna talk about the Young's double slit experimentally, and we will sketch and interpret intensity graphs of double slit interference patterns. You can see the two equations over here on the right. Uh, the equations are very similar equations, but they are found in two separate sections. Uh, the, this equation here is going to be found in topic 9.3, and the equation on the right is found in topic 4.4. .4. So again, you do need to be a little familiar with the data booklet to do all of this. All right, so first of all, let's, uh, let's just review a little bit what we've talked about before. In the past, we have talked about single slit diffraction. So what, what ended up happening is we took a, um, took a monochromatic and coherent wave source. Uh, the typical, uh, I'll give you a, a second to think, what does monochromatic and coherent mean? You can pause the video. A monochromatic means we are one wavelength and coherent means that it, everything is all lined up. Everything's in phase with each other. Basic example of this is a laser. Lasers are coherent and monochromatic. And what we did is we sent this coherent monochromatic light through a very, very thin uh, opening, and we saw a, um, a situation like you see on the screen right now. We see a what we call a single slit diffraction pattern. Now, the single slit diffraction pattern uh, on the y-axis, as you can see, we have intensity, and the x-axis is position. We could also have uh, angle on the uh, x-axis as well if we felt like it. Um, uh, just depends on what type of problem we have. <clears throat> now, we measured a few things. Uh, one of the, the big things we measured was this measurement right here, starting at the center and moving out here to the edge. And the first thing we did is we found the angle to that area there. The angle, we said theta equals lambda over b, lambda being wavelength and b being the slit width. We also stated a situation where we have our single slit and our screen. The screen is separated by distance D. And we have the first minimum. Uh, now, normally, this is the angle we're finding. We're finding the angle to the first minimum, but we might also want to find X. Uh, X would be the distance to the first minimum. And when using small angles, when using small angles, theta equals x over d, and so we can come up with the equation of x over d equals lambda over b. Now this equation is helpful for when we're finding things like the, uh, the width of the central maximum. Remember the central maximum is this uh, width right here uh, from one minimum to the other, and so that would be 2x. And so all I need to do is take my wavelength, multiply by the distance to the screen, divided by the slit width, and find the central maximum. So this one slit diffraction pattern is for one slit laser going through it. Today we're going to do, and you saw in the video before this hopefully, uh, we're going to look at a situation where we're going to take a uh, two slits just like this. Each slit has a width. We'll still call that width B. But now we're going to be doing some double slit. And double slit problems are actually sort of, I think, cognitively easier to understand than single slit. Double slit is pretty straightforward. Double slit, diffraction, how about diffraction? There we go. Diffraction, there we go. Uh, being at home has not improved my ability to spell. So typically what we're going to do is we're going to take two slits. These are typically very narrow slits, but they uh, they are still slits, none of this, all the same. 
And we are going to uh, cast a laser upon them. So a wave is coming in. We'll have our wave coming in here. Now the wave will enter both slits. Some go through the top slit, some go through the bottom slit, and this wave will interfere with itself. Obviously, uh, very, very similarly to um, how we've done this before. So we'll say in the center here, we're going to have a wave from top and a wave from the bottom. Now you'll notice the wave from the top and the wave from the bottom, they both have traveled an equal distance. Their path difference was zero, and so we would be seeing constructive interference at this point. Indeed, right in the middle of this uh, image, you're always going to see constructive interference. But with double slit diffraction, what I'm more interested in is, well, when is the next area? When is the next maximum? Now this is one difference between double slit and single slit diffraction. In single slit, we talk about the first minimum typically. With double slit, we're typically talking about the maximums, the areas of highest intensity. And so if we draw the two rays, the top ray and the bottom ray, and again, we're going to say this is the first maximum. The bottom ray has traveled a little bit further. The bottom ray has some type of path difference. Now, what type of interference will we get when we are at the first maximum? You say constructive interference, you are right. Uh, and so if you're the first maximum, that means this bottom wave down here has traveled one full wavelength further. Has traveled one complete extra wavelength further. This is going to make it uh, where the bottom wave is now caught back up with the top wave. They are now back in phase and we uh, have a nice pretty little um, uh, constructive interference. Now the two slits are going to be separated by a distance called lowercase d. Um, and we again will have an angle to the first maximum. Now again, some people always ask, Mr. Reynolds, is that the angle from the top ray or the bottom ray? These are typically fractions of millimeters apart, so in the real world it just doesn't frankly matter. Now what we'll find is we have made uh, a bit of a, um, uh, a bit of a triangle here. And so we can actually pull out the equation in topic 9.3. The equation says n lambda equals d sine theta. Notice in this situation we are using sine theta. We are not necessarily using our small angle approximation. Uh, and you'll see why as we get uh, later on uh, into future topics. But uh, n uh, will stand for any whole number. So 1, 2, 3, etc. Lambda there stands for wavelength, measured in meters. Uh, D stands for distance between slits. And theta is the angle from center to the nth maximum. Now when I say the nth maximum, if we're dealing with uh, the first maximum, I'll use an n of 1. If I'm dealing with the fifth, I'll use an n of 5. And so here is our basic equation, n lambda equals d sine theta. With this, we're going to be able to find that angle. And obviously, as the n value goes up, our angle will get larger and larger. Now this is an HL equation, and, uh, and uh, right now we're not dealing with HL versus SL, but thankfully in the SL realm, they do have another equation that, that can be slightly similar. Before I do that, let me uh, throw up a picture of the uh, actual double slit diffraction here. So let me show you, whoops, never mind. Uh, let's pull up, here we go. This is a picture of double slit diffraction. You'll notice double slit diffraction looks slightly different than single slit diffraction in that you can still see that uh, orangish envelope for single slit diffraction. It's still there. But now we have these blue uh, peaks. We call these peaks fringes. Obviously, if, if our y-axis is intensity, these fringes are uh, places where we have constructive interference. So these fringes are going to be, here's n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4, and so on. 
Now, one thing that uh, IB does want you to be able to do is they want you to be able to tell how far apart are these fringes. Each fringe is approximately the same distance apart. And so in topic 4.4, they give you an equation that actually helps you find this. 4.4 gives you the equation S equals lambda D over D. Now this equation, you can probably guess what S stands for. S is the spacing between fringes. Lowercase d is the same lowercase d we've used before. This is the distance between slits. Uh, capital D is distance from slits to screen. And the lambda here is, of course, the wavelength. So if you plug all this in with any kind of monochromatic and coherent wave, we're going to get the distance between the fringes. That could be any uh, distance, these two, these two, these two, these two, these two, and so on. So we have our two equations here for double slit diffraction. We have n lambda equals d sine theta. This is going to let you find the angle to the nth maximum. And we have s equals lambda d over d. Let me show you a quick picture of um, double slit diffraction in action. First of all, we'll look at the actual, uh, what would actually happen if we shot a red laser through a, um, through a double slit. You notice here we have several uh, fringes, fringe, 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 very equally spaced. We could find the spacing between these to find whatever we wanted. But we also have areas where the fringes sort of die out a little bit, sort of like a minimum out here, and then places where these fringes come back a little stronger. And so we see two separate things happening. We see a double slit pattern. A double slit is where you see all these fringes right next to each other. But if you sort of cross your eyes a little bit, you can actually see a bit of a single slit pattern with minimums and maximums. And it turns out that both of these uh, function together in the same way. Let me show you a picture, another picture of a double slit diffraction uh, set up here. Here we go. So here's another example of double slit diffraction. You'll notice the uh, intensity graph at the top. They call it irradiance. Don't worry about that. It's just intensity. And we see position on the x-axis. But we see something sort of strange. You'll notice down here at the bottom you have fringes, very distinct but then the fringes start to die out. The fringes start to get a little dimmer. What's happening is the amplitude of these fringes is actually governed by the width of each slit that makes up the double slit. Okay, so uh, let's, let's go back. Let's, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's take a look at these. So we have two, two factors in play here. The first factor is we have the width of slit. Now the width of slit controls the single slit pattern. And even if we're dealing with a double slit, you still have a single slit pattern. You can see that pattern on the outside, this outside pattern right here. If I change the width of that slit, you would see the uh, the amplitudes, let's say I, I made the slit more narrow. Okay, think about the equation theta equals lambda over b. If the uh, slit width became more narrow, b became smaller, then our angle would have to go up. So making the slit width smaller would cause the, uh, the envelope, the single slit envelope to get wider. And these amplitudes would go up. They would actually increase. So the width of slit controls the single slit pattern. The other factor we have is the distance between slits. Now this controls the spacing of fringes. And we saw that uh, the equation before and, uh, of, of how that works. So we have the spacing of fringes uh, with our double slit pattern. So we have a fringe here, fringe here, fringe here. If I 
take the slits farther apart or closer together, it's going to change that spacing. We have the equation for the, the spacing, of course. We have the n lambda equals d sine theta. And so if I, uh, if I come here and I increase the distance between the slits, then the, uh, the theta, they're going to get closer and closer together. So double slit diffraction actually deals with both single slit and double slit concepts. Uh, let me show you, bring, a, bring an old picture back up here. Take a look here. So again, this is our two slit interference pattern. Now, if we imagine we had some nice numbers that we could read very easily off of here, there are two things I'd want to be able to figure out. I could find the width of the slit. So I could find the width of the slit by taking the um, angle to first minimum. That's going to be right here. And then using the equation, theta equals lambda over b. That will help me find the width of both slits in double slit diffraction. You will not need to worry about a situation where you have um, one large slit, one small slit together in double slit. There are always going to be two identical slits in double slit. So you can find the width of each slit using the angle to the first minimum. If I wanted to figure out how far apart those slits were, uh, the distance between slits, I could use one of two equations. I could use n lambda equals uh, d sine theta. Now that would be a situation where I'm given the angle. Um, if, if um, you know, we're, we're given the, uh, uh, if our x-axis had angle instead of position. In this case, we have position on the x-axis, and so it's not uh, as necessary. But if I want to, um, I, I could also use the equation s equals lambda d over d, where s would be the spacing between two fringes, just like such. So it's a two-slit diffraction pattern. It is governed by single slit and double slit. If, I, if we move up here, we see that they want you to uh, be able to, um, the modulation of the double slit by the one slit diffraction effect, this is exactly what they're talking about. They're talking about the situation that the double slit pattern is controlled or modulated by that single slit pattern. The last thing I want to talk about is thinking about the amplitude of the actual um, waves. Because uh, amplitude sometimes is a little tough to see, and this will be very much more important in our next lesson. Our next lesson is actually going to take double slit, and we'll go to triple, quadruple, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We'll talk about how to deal with situations like that. But um, if we had a situation where, let's say, uh, we had a, uh, well, actually, let me just, I'll put that image down there again, actually. Tell you what, let's put that image back down. Okay. So here's our, uh, here's our double slit pattern. If I were to cover up one of the slits, what would we see? So here's what we see with our double slit. If you were to cover up one of the slits, what would you then see? I'll give you a moment to think about that. So what's going to happen? As many of you would have guessed, uh, probably you would guess, oh, we would just fill in this whole thing and we would see all this intensity of all this wave, just, just like such. It would be one solid graph. And there's a slight problem with that. The problem is this. If we think about intensity versus position, the more area under that graph equals more energy. Now, if I covered up half of the light hitting this diffraction pattern, I certainly am not adding more energy. This highlighted portion you see in the image is certainly much, much more of an integral, much more energy than the double slit pattern, which that doesn't really make sense. So to deal with this, we look at an equation. We actually haven't talked about it yet, but we're going to look at it a little bit more in the next uh, topic here. And that is intensity is proportional to the square of the amplitude. Now, what happens here is when you have double slit diffraction, when you have double slit diffraction, 
Let's draw a double slit with a thing there. And you have two waves. Ignoring any, actually, let's just look at the central maximum. So let's just do this. There we go. Go to the center. When you have two waves, and those two waves are impacting at the same time, we have what's called constructive interference. Now, if the if the intense, let's say the um, the amplitude of each wave is a. So for constructive interference, if you have two a amplitudes coming together, what would you what would you do with those amplitudes? You would just add them together. And so in this situation, we have an intensity of 2a because those two amplitudes have been added together. Now by adding those two amplitudes together, I've doubled the amplitude. And if I bring that over here, I'll find that if I double the amplitude and I square that, it means my intensity is actually going to be four times higher. By taking two slits and shining the same laser through the same width slit, you're actually increasing your intensity by a factor of four. And so back to my original question. If I covered up one of the slits, my new amplitude would be A, which means my new intensity would simply be I, which is one quarter of the initial intensity of 4i. And so if I go to a quarter, quarters right about here, we're still going to have the same basic shape. That's more like a third, but whatever. We're just going to imagine this is a, a i over 4. It's still the same shape. It still has the minimums in the same positions and that sort of thing. By covering up one of these two slits, we're going to have a much lower intensity. These are the basic notes for double slit diffraction. What I'm going to have you do is I'm going to put an assignment on uh, the uh, manager back assignment you're seeing right now. And I'm going to have you read through the book. I'm going to have you read and sort of see this from another source. And I'm going to have you work out those worked examples. I want you to try the worked examples, see how they work, see what you can do on those. And then I'll be back in a second video where we maybe talk through a problem or two. In addition, you'll have some homework where you have some problems like this. And we'll go over that homework on Friday when we talk about... Um, we have a little face-to-face -face Google Hangout kind of thing. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're feeling well. Uh, this is Mr. Reynolds talking about double slit diffraction.